Hello, and welcome back to On the Brink. I'm Shailene, and today I'm here with Manu Pillay, founder and CEO of Carbon Bridge, a company developing ultra-low carbon microbial methanol. Carbon Bridge's innovative solution is helping forward-thinking industry leaders meet low-carbon fuel regulations. The company joined Brink's portfolio last year when they participated in our climate tech program. And they were recently selected for Greenwell's prestigious ARPA-E Award. Congratulations on that, by the way. Manu, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you on. So without further ado, I'll just dive right in. Let's start with your background. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, your time before Carbon Bridge and what inspired you to start, or at least what was the catalyst to start Carbon Bridge? So that's a bit of a long journey. And it's very rare that you have this one lightning in a bottle moment that triggers everything. My career started uh, several years ago, working in Japan in hardware engineering. And right. from there, I came to the United States from Japan. I worked in more hardware engineering, design, manufacturing, and test. Uh, built laptops, storage systems, networking gear. And uh, along the way, I kind of was cleaning up my garage and discovering all these old prototypes and things that slaved over. And I realized no, there was nothing really long lasting in what we had built. There was always the next model, the next iteration, the new iPhone, the new Mac, the equivalent to that. And so I thought about it and I started a company called Waterbit. And Waterbit was oriented towards outdoor irrigation automation. And so within that, we innovated for a zero battery solution, because even then I didn't want pollution running around. So no batteries, no lithium ion waste, nothing to handle, just running on super capacitors and energy harvesting. So kind of very uh, nitty gritty hardware tech. Um, Built that up with uh, farmers all across California and some across the United States. And in doing so, I started to notice that the farmers were adjusting their crops to address climate change. And and that really brought it in that even in North America and California, where you think you're hidden away from the effects of climate change. And so I started to think about that more deeply and realized that we should do something about it. And that was the trigger for me to start thinking about carbon bridge and how to do something that actually made a difference was the next challenge. And that was really how we came to the decision to start uh, carbon bridge. Amazing. So I know that, you know, it sounds like this started just from noticing or observing the absolute need Mm -hmm. to do this. So I want to ask, what was the initial like problem statement or challenge that you guys aimed to, to solve with carbon bridge and how did it evolve over time? You find that very amazing. Is it because it's changed quite a few times? <laughs> it has indeed. You see, the, the, the curse of the second time founder is that you revert to the space that you were successful in the first time. So initially I thought about how do we do climate change along with agriculture and farming. So yeah. I dug into soil carbon. I dug into agricultural waste. I looked at how do we handle these different issues? And after a while, it really came down to this. The climate change issue that we have is the result of burning a lot of fossil fuel. The majority of that fossil fuel that has created the problem we're in has come from the industrialized world, less than a billion people standard living, driving the fuel consumption. Mm. There are now about four or five billion people more wanting to also raise their standards of living. So you start to look at that and say, well, you know, how are you going to provide that energy? And all of a sudden, the problem statement changes. It's like, okay, let's now provide renewable energy, but it has to be done in a way that everyone can access it. So no more dependency on geo- geopolitically challenged sources of energy. So everyone has to be able to access it. It has to be low cost, otherwise nobody will use it. It has to be simple, otherwise you can't build it. And it's got to be able to use local materials. So that was the new definition of carbon rich, which is the, we're now going to start becoming an energy company. And so with that statement, then what do you do, what do, you do next? And that yeah. was how we 
we redefined the problem to be one of uh, energy production and problem. And that was right about the time I was in the break program and the, the ability to converse with some of the mentors and just to clarify the way of thinking was very helpful. We right. could have run around and convinced investors to invest in us because even now the company's running around getting funding for the things we've left in. I'm not saying that those are bad bets. I'm just saying that we chose not to do those. Maybe it will work for somebody else, but it wasn't going to work for the scale of problem we were trying to solve. We wanted to solve this problem uh, at a planetary scale. How do you do this so that multiple billions of people could change their standard of living through accessible energy, not just build a company so that Shell or BP would buy you, but rather build a company that would transform uh, what's going on. Not sure that was too long in response. No, not at all. I think it, it definitely paints a very full picture of the origin story, but also the values of the company, which is exactly why we're here and what we're here to find out. So thank you for that. But I do have to ask, so it sounds like with all these factors that you had to constantly kind of adjust and mm-hmm. pivot, what has been the biggest hurdle of it all that you faced as a founder in climate tech and how did you overcome mm-hmm. it? So when I was in college, you could call me stupid, right? Because I'm dyslexic. So I've had this learning disability that I've had to deal with through my life. And that has caused issues for me. Yeah. And so I work around that. So in order to be able to succeed in what I do, I do what I call straight line or first principles thinking. And then I can always read a book and find out the exact circuits I need to do. And I I try never to memorize circuits because I always get the inputs and outputs wrong, even if they only two. Because the dyslexia will kill me, right? So I focus fundamentally on what I have to accomplish first. Mm -hmm. And then then it works out better. So when we went to first principles engineering, the question is, how do you make things at lowest cost? Well, to figure out what the lowest cost is, you have to figure out what the costs are today and where the cost is hidden. Right. So what we discovered was the biggest challenge was in undoing people's way of thinking. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, someone says I make renewable or I do e-fuels, I do something, right? In today's world, all you have really stated is you've changed the source of your inputs. So as an example, we make renewable methanol. Our primary inputs are methane and the bacteria do the rest of the work to break it down into carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. I take water and break it down to create hydrogen. So it's electrolysis. I throw away the oxygen because ain't nobody paying for that. And then I take the carbon dioxide, hydrogen, carbon monoxide. Now it's called syngas. So it's a totally new thing, yeah. which there's no specifications. So it drives me nuts. And then uh, it goes into the system where you apply high temperature and high pressure to create your system. Or if you're one of the new catalysts, you have this exotic material that nobody can manufacture at scale or depends on materials that are, again, sourced from geopolitically constrained places. So you've not really changed the solution. Uh, you've not really solved the problem. You've, you've morphed it and covered it up in PowerPoint and other things. And so these long-term become uh, challenging. And of course, when these sol- solutions are presented with people with a background and from the leading universities, then it has plausible deniability. You can always invest in said company and say, well, it came you know, from XYZ University, so it must have been great. So the biggest challenge we had was the, the scale of the innovation we had, the, the thought process was so radical that there was that difficulty. And again, I'm not a PhD person. In fact, I had one investor actually look at me and say, how could you have come up with this idea? I was thinking, well, that's a really insulting question. You know, it was that combination of the radicalness of the idea. And the second, the fact that this was coming from a team that was not conventional. And these two things were the biggest uh, problem. Mm. And we saw that occur where, you know, we had well-prepared information and analyzed and experimental data. And yet we were being left aside when it came to investor funding. So I would say that was the biggest challenge. The irony was that when we conversed with people in the U.S. national labs, Lawrence Livermore, Lawrence Berkeley, 
where you had scientists whose day and day and job was to break boundaries, they immediately saw the originality of what we've had. And so now we have increasing close relationships with a number of researchers at the national labs because they actually want to work with us because they have already identified that what we're doing is the breakthrough they've been looking. So I think it really depends, you know, that has been the biggest challenge is really the mental model. And because uh, what we've seen with investors is so every investor says, and this is, I'm not, I'm not trying to put down my friends in the investor community, but every investor has a thesis that says we are going to be the most original. We're picking the winners. But the reality is that they are greatly influenced by others. So if one person says no, the courage to say yes is, is weakened dramatically. And so I think that the, these are things we, we need to be aware of. Well, I think it's, it's fascinating. And I think the fact that you can be using all your industry jargon to someone like me, who obviously doesn't have that much of an understanding, and you keep me reined in anyway. So... <laughs> Um, no, it's a great, great answer. Thank you so much. So I do want to ask, how do you balance? It does sound like this balance is incredibly important to you. Um, but how do you balance the urgency of addressing climate issues? And actually, you know, that being the priority with the challenges of building a sustainable business. I know that, you know, you've had to pivot so many times. But other than that, how do you balance that? Yeah, so when you, when you go to the beach or the coast, yeah. which I do to clear my head from time to time, you know, the best swimmers in the business, the fish, they don't make bubbles. They just move. Yeah. And land animals like otters and seals as well, they go in, no, no splashing. They just go in and they move. They're quiet. Yeah. And so what I saw was for us to be efficient for us to actually make a difference, we had to be efficient. We had to make the fewest bubbles. We had to make the fewest splashes. We had to move fast with the resources that we had. And so the only way to build a scalable business, going back to the earlier points, was to make the business simple. And so yeah. we've ended up spending more time on trying to make the process simple. And, you know, it's, one of the hardest things in engineering is to make a product with this simple user interface. Uh, I have a Casio that I bought 15 years ago, it still works, but yeah. I've forgotten how to set it. It's got all the different buttons and all that. Yeah. And so I gave up, you know, I just said, you know, the heck with that. And I just got myself a, an old school watch. Yeah. Analog and, style. You know, analog style. And uh, yeah. when I change time zones, I take the thing out and change the time and I'm done and I don't yeah. have any firmware updates. I don't have any buttons to push. It just works. Right. And so I needed to create a company that was, it just works because yeah. if you could do that, then you could scale fast. The problem yeah. with trying to build something really big in a hurry is that it consumes a lot of resources and the places where this energy revolution is needed are not particularly mm. wealthy. Uh, I'll give you an example. The entire GDP of Malaysia is less than the annual revenue of a couple of companies in California. The entire GDP of India is less than the combined valuation of uh, Apple and NVIDIA, just two companies. So to put things in perspective, when you have countries of that scale with that population, the per capita budget availability to do radical things is limited. And it's important to realize that these uh, other countries have other priorities like education and health, and they can't just all throw in and say, oh, we're going green tomorrow. So we had yeah. to build a system that could be simple. So in order to move fast, we had to be simple first. And I think that mm -hmm. that's one of the things that the RPE grant funding is going to allow us to do is to build a system anchored in outward simplicity, but radically sophisticated in terms of its software and control systems engine. I think it brings me nicely to my next question, which is what are the 
plans for Carbon Bridge with this with this grant? We do want to know what is the what's next for Carbon Bridge and what we can expect from the company. Fair enough. Incredibly valuable, but it's also incredibly challenging. The conditions for us to win. Mm. Um, so, to give context, ARPAE is the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Department of Energy. Right. It's supposed to take on projects that have transformational capability. It's not allowed to invest in incremental change. So the right. fact that they've picked us is a, it's itself an indicator of that. So for example, incremental change can be funded by the Department of Energy, so other projects or other project finance. Mm. RPE only takes on transformational projects. So it's a subset. We got picked on our merits in competing against pretty much every research entity in the United States. We were the only biological based process picked. I think also the way we are using biology. Success for us in this RPE project is to essentially turn an entire bioreactor into something the size of a cute microwave oven, which has never been done before. Yeah. And that, you know, you should expect to see in about March next year, March 22nd, 25, actually. Wow. Hard date on that. And so we're taking an entire bioreactor system and it gets to be a microwave oven size. The other part that's very interesting about the RPE mandate is that they've required our system to be able to operate with intermittent power because we still need electricity to run the control systems to run pumps, heat exchangers, and other things that we still need to do. So it's not completely free of electricity. So, but right. we are required to demonstrate that we can pull the plug, let the system collapse, and then put, pull the plug back, and then demonstrate that we can recover within 30 minutes. And so that's pretty hard to do with biology, right? It's hard enough to do if you have thermochemical systems. Demonstration uh, will be for later in 2025. And that to us is success. It means that now we can scale this technology anywhere that we can find bacteria, which is a no brainer because these bacteria are from the wild. Anywhere we can find a little bit of electricity. So anywhere that's got wind, solar, thermal, that's easy. We don't use very much. And so that unlocks scale. You could go home with our microwave size system and take the compost from your kitchen waste. And you could make fuel at home with a microwave re reactor. You might not want to, but you know, you could. Yes. And then for, a lot, for larger systems, you could go wider than that. That's really the key is deceptive simplicity. The design of the system is intended to be manufactured anywhere you can get a machine shop. So anywhere you can get a machine shop is anywhere in the world. All we need is a reasonable a food grade of stainless steel, which is anywhere right. in the world. So there are no restrictions in our supply chain. There's a little bit of hardware, firmware control that we need to do. We are funded by the U.S. Department of Energy in this. So there are some export control constraints we have and who we can support. But yeah, right. that's how, that's how we move to the next step. So it's been a while coming, but now you can see clearly a path to building simple use from a user point of view simple, elegant machines that provide energy that can be, you know, because methanol can be stored for months. So you can yeah. take energy that you can produce anytime this uh, renewable energy and stash it and use it whenever you need it. So this is really the transformation that we've been looking for. And I hope to, to see this deploy rapidly starting from uh, late next year. And so business models could include licensing, joint ventures, everything's open. Wow. I want to say, I, I, I don't think I really completely grasped the extent of how powerful the work you guys are doing until you just explain it just then. And I want to say it's such a privilege to be speaking to you about this because I can hear the amazing change and impact that this innovation could have. And it is so exciting. I think this is the perfect moment to um, emphasize the fact that you went through our Brink Climate Tech Accelerator. We were so pleased to have you come through and join, and join our ecosystem. So I do want to ask, what aspects of the program had the most impact on your company's growth and development? I know you mentioned the mentors, so maybe we want to 
expand on that. So one of the things that uh, I really appreciated, and Janina and Elisa have done such a bang-up job on that, my list of people who can call me anytime for anything, and if I can, I will help. Yeah, so they're an elite group there. <laughs> Not too many in that group. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think what they did was, I'll give you an example of uh, the value that they brought. Sophia is my co-founder. And yeah. so we're obviously very diverse and, well, she's female, I'm not. I made a special request to Janina. I said, Janina, can you make sure that we have a mentor group around Sophia to help her be a female leader? And that was something that Janina listened to me and said, yeah, let's do this. And even now, Sophia's got that network going where she can reach in and say, hey, I want to talk to somebody. And making Sophia successful has made us successful. So it was really a big deal for me to be able to say, hey, I don't know how to handle this problem, but hey, Janina, yeah. can you help me with that? And so that was yeah. fantastic. That was a, a little bit of customization for us that wasn't done for everybody else that, you know, because we have the unique situation. And so that yeah. was fantastic. And I think they ex expanded that later to help other female founders and co-founders. The other part was the quality of the mentors and the quality of the feedback. Now we didn't, uh, we were not always able to maintain the relationship post program, but during the program, I know I've been looking at my notes. Even now I go back and look at my notes. I said, what did that person say? So a couple of people are still in touch with us. And I think that that uh, was very useful, um, especially because we were in that transition when we entered, when we applied to the program, we were still talking about thermochemical methods. And by the time we exited the program, we were hardcore deep into biotech. So right. break was this unusual period where we were in flight. Mm -hmm. And so we were not fully able to leverage all the, the assets like fundraising, because like, what do you fundraise on when you're in mid flight, right? Yeah. We didn't have the data, but the mentor relationships and you know, helping Sophia be successful, that's really the continuing value of the program for us. Fantastic. We're so glad to hear that you had a good experience. Final question before we move on to the quick fire game segment that we play is what advice do you wish you had when you first became founder and CEO of this company? Or just what advice do you have for entrepreneurs in this space in general? Oh, obviously, it reflects my biases. Other people would have different opinions. I think there are there's two or three categories of companies that one can start. One can start a business based around consulting and that in case you need tremendous expertise in something that I would be willing to pay you for as an example. In the climate area that is hard to achieve because it's such a new area per se, there are yeah. people who talk about different things, but um, when you pull knowledge is shallow, so this is probably not the best area. There might be some people who have consultancy capability in saying accounting and that's an ergo carbon account. But then again, that requires an understanding of physics and chemistry at some point. Uh, no offense to some of the folks I've run, I've run into, but English literature and physics, chemistry, they don't really overlap too good. You need to right. be more technical in these areas. So I would say calibrate carefully what you want to do. And if your background is English literature, then seek a career in copywriting and messaging. And if your background is in accounting and finance, then there's, so in other words, don't try to force fit, look at what you're doing and then see how we can assign value. Like one of the biggest issues we're going to have, and this is where the history and literature folks, especially if you've taken up law as well, influencing policy is really yeah. a big deal. So these are things you can do without raising venture running money, right? Then there's, of course, the project finance aspect, which is I'm going to take a mature technology. I'm going to build something around it. And that's not a venture business, but it's a really good business. And so I think those, those are the other class of opportunities. Those, unfortunately, are very dependent on personal contacts. Yeah. And uh, so a little, bit of, a little bit of, if you know some of those. Um, and then of course the engineering around that, the EPCs, these are all great places to work at so that, that deliver real project. Then the last category is like, okay, I'm going to start a company to do something, which I would suggest should be your last option. Right? Yeah. Don't do it. Right? If you can, if you can avoid it, don't start it. 
It's really a pain in the ass. <laughs> Just don't do it. But Absolutely. if you are forced, yeah, don't do it. But if you are forced to, to start your own company, then I would say, uh, take a look at, be honest with yourself about you know, those first principles. Like what's the, what's the problem you were trying to solve? And I, as so you can recall from our prior conversation, we didn't have all the answers ready made to start with. So be prepared to iterate. That would be my advice. You have really hit the nail on the head of the theme of this show, which is we always say that we we speak to entrepreneurs to find out why people should not go into entrepreneurship and all the reasons that keeps them going despite those reasons. So thank you for the incredibly apt answer. <laughs> Very suitable for this show. So thank you. That concludes the sort of serious part of this conversation. Now we're going to play our quick game before I let you go for the day. Um, so your task is to judge each scenario as either madness, meaning an entrepreneurial faux pas, or greatness, which is a strategy that could pave the way to success. So number one, pivoting your tech to focus on a completely new application that promises a greater environmental impact but requires really significant R and D. Madness or that's greatness? what we did. So I'm going with that one. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm like, if you say madness, I'm gonna be shocked right now. <laughs> Next, um, accepting a government partnership that offers access to large scale industrial clients, but comes with high regulatory red tape that could slow down innovation. In the energy space, regulation and energy go together. So the sooner we yeah. roll up the sleeves and accept that, you do it. Great point. Number three, rejecting a lucrative exit opportunity because you believe your business hasn't yet reached its full potential and can achieve greater impact. I think it depends on who's making the offer and also how many, how many commas there are in the offer. <laughs> Very so, good point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, so at the end of the day, we are taking investor funds. We have to generate a return. Otherwise, it's not fair to those who's take the risk. So as a founder, I always have to be open to that. In terms of providing a greater return, there are only two options. Do we take the company public or do you wait for a better, better offer, right? Only two exist. Taking the company public is of course, everyone's dream. We too want to do that. And yeah. that requires a willingness to have financial systems in place, uh, audits, audit trails, and a lot of stuff that are in the box of not fun. It depends on that one. I, I, I wouldn't want to slam the door shut in either one of those, but I think that if your company is peaking where you're seeing the growth rates fattening and you're out of ideas, take the offer. Love that. And final one for you, turning down a high profile client because their values don't align with your company's mission, even though it could be a major revenue driver. What are your thoughts on that one? That's the right call, because if you built a company up with values, then just jettisoning those values will wreck the company internally. Absolutely. And when you have a major customer with poor value sets, eventually they will also fail and take you down with them. Very well said. Thank you so much, Manu. That is all I have for you today. Do you have anything to add before we close off? I would add that for entrepreneurs who want to be out there, uh, it's not something I would recommend unless you really, truly want to do this. And an entrepreneur, it's a, it's like a barbell. You either become an entrepreneur because you have no choice, like you have a family business and you're running it and you want to scale it, or you have yeah. choice. And the choice is you're doing something because it's the best option available to you at a given point in time. Yeah. I would skate away from starting a startup because everyone else in school is doing it because your friends are doing it or something with like yeah, I, just, I would stay away from that. Manu, I do want to thank you again. I need to reiterate that um, it really was such an honor to hear you speak about your innovation. I am so excited about what Carbon Bridge is going to achieve. And all of us at Brink here are cheering you the heck on. So um, best of luck with the next chapter. Thank you. Um, to find out more about Carbon Bridge, please visit carbonbridge.io. And to learn more about all the um, other amazing founders and mentors in Brink's ecosystem, head to brink.io. And don't forget to subscribe for the next episode of On the Brink, now available on both YouTube and Spotify. See you next time.